Hello again from Jerusalem. Uh, this is Powers in Play, TV7 News Israel's program, surveying the international scene, not only the Middle East. And uh, our topic today is personality and power. What impact does the particular character of world leaders, as distinct from their national units, have on world affairs? And with us, as usual, are Colonel in the Reserves, Miri Eisen, Ambassador Daniel Alon, uh, formerly the Israeli Ambassador to Washington and Deputy Foreign Minister, and Reserve Colonels Ruven Ben Shalom and Aran Lerman. Hey. Welcome aboard. Miri, uh, right now, um, the entire world, of course, is focused on what is happening between Russia and the Ukraine. Is the fact that Russia is being led uh, by Vladimir Putin, who has been in office first as prime minister and then as president, prime minister again, and off and on again, president for 22 years now, is that fact uh, in any way central to what uh, we see? Uh, because before uh, Putin, um, there was Boris Yeltsin, who was uh, uh, a strong leader only in 1991, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Gorbachev and um, uh, the coup attempt uh, against the um, leadership of the Soviet Union. But later, as the leader of Russia, was quite weak and was succeeded by a strong Putin. Uh, does that matter? It matters. All right, let's think about it, okay, gentlemen who are with me right now. What's the picture in your mind visually of Vladimir Putin? You see him now without his shirt? You see him now with a tiger? That's what we think of when we think Vladimir Putin. Images matter in this case, in that sense of his um, sending out those kind of vibes. I'm not sure about anybody else in the room, but I have been in a room with Vladimir Putin. Um, as I say, I was in the room. I certainly wasn't the one who made any decisions. I was there on a prime minister visit in both uh, an official meeting and then an official dinner. He's the only person I've ever been in a room with, Amir, that literally scared me. And I wasn't seated nearby. So yes, I do think that that personality, what that sends out, the vibes, makes a difference. And people both admire and are scared of Vladimir Putin. And that matters. It matters now. And it's mattered for many years. But as a former intelligence officer, uh, were you uh, perhaps um, beholden to the myth of the KGB, which uh, he came from? I'm asking that because I also happen to uh, accompany to have accompanied the Prime Minister Paris uh, uh, when he was uh, president. And um, when he met Putin, uh, he was, of course, senior to Putin, and uh, he had the chutzpah to suggest, this was 10 years ago, that he, Paris, uh, will mediate between Putin and President Obama. Uh, and, of course, Joe Biden uh, was, was uh, Obama's uh, vice uh, president. And uh, Putin... Uh, um, very politely declined. Um, there was there was a feeling that this was someone, Paris, who has seen better days, and Putin, who just came out of a hunting accident or some other uh, extreme sports accident, um, was was uh, injured. Uh, he held himself in a brace or or something, but but uh, he did project uh, vitality. So the vitality is one aspect. I don't think that we're scared today of the KGB in the way that you would have thought once upon a time. I do think that within countries, when you have a leader who is perceived both visually as somebody very strong, and I would say, and I'm scared, I'm talking about Putin, to say somebody who gives vibes of brutal, okay? I mean, this is my own vibe in that sense. Vladimir and Paler. The, the combination with knowing that he was KGB, and the fact that he rules over a country which is not an open democracy with an easy change of government, that he he essentially does what he wants. That's a... Uh, I have an identical yeah. question for, I, I, for, you, for Iran yeah. for Iran and for Danny. Um, what about you, me? <coughs> you, I, I keep for the coup de grace. Okay. <laughs> 
you, Iran, uh, was um, in the intelligence uh, branch and later the National Security Council. And you, Danny, um, were in the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, and the Washington uh, embassy. Have you been writing leadership profiles, both uh, as a military officer and as a diplomat? And when you uh, later had uh, the chance to meet those subjects, um, was your impression different? First of all, uh, I have to say it is a very different experience from, you know, uh, uh, but I was reminded since we are talking about Russia, uh, I will not mention the politician, but at one point uh, we did commission a, a psychologist to have a look at the profile of not, not Putin, certainly. An Israeli politician. Uh, <laughs> a Russian politician at the, of the time, one of the challenges. He came back delighted. He said, finally, finally a clinical case. <laughs> <laughs> because most, uh, but you have to bear in mind, for a generation of Israeli intelligence officers, uh, the countries in the region were synonymous with their leaders. Syria was Assad. Egypt was Mubarak. Libya was Gaddafi for 42 years. So Jordan was King Hussein. We are now beginning to learn that things can actually sometimes change after 30 or 40 years. And Israel was Bibi. And uh, we, well, I, I'm sure that people who do uh, profiles here on Israel are learning something. But can, can but, you do it by remote control? You can learn quite a lot. I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, you, you speak to people who, who, who know these individuals. Well, you read biographies, and autobiographies sometimes, some, or, or shadow-written autobiographies. Um, you go into... I, 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 uh, I remember that uh, when we had to re uh, figure out if the United States would go to war for Kuwait, Aspects of uh, George Bush, father, Bush 41, aspects of his personal biography as, the, as a very brave uh, fighter pilot in the Pacific mattered uh, in understanding uh, why he is cautious about war and why he would ultimately go to war because he bears in mind uh, the lessons. By the way, the lessons which are now in the air, Munich, people are talking about Munich. So, Danny... Um you were handed over the Bush family uh, as the ambassador to Washington or earlier when you uh, were Sharon's uh, uh, political and diplomatic advisor. Um, but you had the chance to speak with people in the administration, in Congress, in the media, uh, Jewish leaders. What was your impression? Um, when was it different from an officer, a staff officer in Jerusalem and when you were in Washington? Well, first of all, I would like to say <clears throat> to your earlier question that, yes, we did do some profiles, but not in a methodical, systematic uh, way, as maybe they do it in the intelligence. Of course, it was mostly psychological, which is not absolute or concrete, as uh, gathering DNA samples. But we had an advantage, because unlike uh, countries of uh, conflict, you know, we deal, deal with friendly countries, and especially in the United States. So we had, I would say, uh, very good sources from the very um, uh, inner circle. Um, so usually, you know, if you have any American politician, not just the president, it's every senator that we have a little profile on. And he has friends in the Jewish community. He has friends in the uh, defense or in the uh, business community. And I can tell you a, a concrete example about Bush. When Bush was elected, you know, he was before the governor of Texas. We have a, as you know, Amir, we have a consulate general in Houston, Texas. We had a consul general there whose duty was to meet occasionally the, the governor. So we had a dossier on, on Bush which was quite large. We knew pretty much, you know, what he likes, what's his personality like, how he is in meetings, what are his uh, areas of uh, interest. So, and this consul general, Sion Evroni, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, he uh, also uh, had some part in sending Governor Bush to Israel when he met with Sharon. Absolutely, absolutely. By the way, with Britain, you mentioned uh, Sion Evron, you know, um, uh, Gidon Meir, you know, may his. Uh, uh, rest, in rest in peace. He uh, actually groomed 
and befriended Tony Blair when he was still a junior parliament, uh, par- parliamentarian. But if I may say... I think in 1960, there was an Israeli diplomat in London who groomed Prince Charles <laughs> and, and is still waiting. Well, if you go back, you probably, uh, I'm sure, uh, you remember uh, Epi Evron, who was the DCM, the deputy chief of mission during Avraham Arman, when Avraham Arman, 65, was the ambassador in Washington. Epi Henry Johnson. Epi, right, why? Let's come because, back to the present, guys. <laughs> he knew Johnson when Johnson was in the Senate. So, but Avram Harman, is, uh, he was large enough as ambassador to let his DCM deal with the president because he knew they had a special chemistry. Um, Reuven Ben Shalom, you are our old China hand. And uh, we have seen uh, Xi Jinping meet with uh, Putin and uh, apparently love was in the air. <laughs> Um, or at least interests. Um, does it matter that uh, after a series of uh, mediocre uh, Chinese uh, leaders um, after uh, Deng Xiaoping that China has for the last uh, decade such a leader? I think it matters a lot. We tend to we tend to think that countries have interests and they're so intertwined that uh, anyway, they have their course and, uh, you know, someone comes along, sits on the chair of prime minister or leader, but how much can he change, right? The, the, the interests, the resources, the history, the, the, the sensitivities, but yet we see that leaders with one meeting, right, if they click or not, everything can change. And I think the Russia-China uh, example is perfect because many people in the world believe that they are naturally co- combined, right? Communists, communists, they're the same. They're probably have mutual interests, yet we see in the history, sometimes they had rifts for years. And then a leader comes along and he identifies something and he's able to communicate with the other leader and then things change. Now I see the, now I think we see it on the rise. And of course it has a lot to do with interest, but also has to do with the personalities. Uh, relating to the whole discussion that we have here, a friend of mine, Yoav Rosenberg, he's a former mm-hmm. uh, colonel from the Israeli intelligence. He just wrote yesterday, uh, that he sees people analyzing the, the, the personalities of Putin and this and that. And he said, guys, I've been working at this for 25 years. I have no idea. So, you know, we can we can take this maybe to the scientific level and have dossiers, as you say, but what are they going to do tomorrow? We don't know. And also, when we look back in history, we see many times that, in hindsight, of course, that one tiny decision, you know, a decision to go up to this line or to that line, in negotiation to press one more point or not, that changes the course of history. So this is certainly relevant to our discussion. Miriam, may, may we use you for a moment as our expert on womanhood? On womanhood. At least there's one around the table. Yeah. Um, now, we had Indira Gandhi, we had Golda Meir, and by the way, uh, in 1974, Henry Kissinger said it was my uh, luck to have to deal with these two leaders in wartime, India versus Pakistan, and the uh, Yom Kippur War. And we just lost Angela Merkel. Well, she's still with us, just not yes. as a counselor. No, on, only for our discussion. Um, is there a difference between um, leaders of either gender? There's differences between leaders, and that has to do with both personalities and gender as part of that. I walk into a room, and I wore today black, And now I kind of regret it because usually as a woman, I can walk into a room and wear a different color and that's okay. It's something that I would notice with Angela Merkel, with Margaret Thatcher, with different women leaders who brought color into the room. Not Golda Meir though. (laughs) Well, she gave us our gold shoes that we But gray is also a color. (laughs) Gray is like, it's the new fashion. I think that women bring into the room in that sense an additional aspect half of the population of the world looking at it. Yes, we are the ones who, with motherhood, pregnancy, our different life cycles definitely impact, and it brings something additional. This isn't about good, bad, right, or wrong. It's about that additional aspect, and when it's missing, it's missing. I'll also add that mansplaining, I say at my table with my four men here that I love, that at the end, that's still a very strong component, and women are still at a disadvantage, and when they are in the room, they they bring that additional aspect to the table, and I wish I would see more women leaders. Europe is going in a different direction in that sense. There's Danny, um, there are, of course, uh, differences in age and uh, background. 
Now, uh, Tony Blair, um, whom you mentioned, was uh, Bill Clinton's age, as was Al Gore, Clinton's running mate. But Bush um, Jr., uh, George W. Bush, uh, was, of course, uh, almost uh, a son to Ariel Sharon. So how do you explain the chemistry between various generations? Well, here, age and mostly experience does matter. More than the age is the experience. So if you look at Bush, four years as a governor, and then coming to the president clean of any any uh, international experience, of course, he would look up to Sharon and would be a little bit intimidated. I as, a as a fellow rancher. Also, as, <laughs> as a fellow rancher, he felt quite it's equal with him. You know, he took him around and all that. But as a politician, as a leader, he was quite, I would say, uh, deferential. By the way, it's the same thing same with Bill Clinton, Clinton and, and, and Rabin. And Rabin. Yep. Same relationship. If I may go back to what Miri said, I also had the privilege, Mutuan maybe, to be in the same room with Vladimir Putin. This was with Arik Sharon. And what he had to suffer Putin, but seeing listen, so many of us. <laughs> hey. But listen, there is a big difference between Putin of 2007 and Putin of 2002, because he was quite humorous. He was not as tough. Yeah, that's what I hear. He yes, and, and also maybe so it's because of the personality of scared. Arik Sharon, a commanding personality. I can tell you it's, it's, it's quite a joke, but when, when, he wanted, uh, when he asked Sharon, why don't you leave the territories, Sharon says, listen, we are a very small country. You want us to be even smaller, but you are a big country. Why don't you give the, um, the islands of Japan, which is, and uh, Putin said, well, we are a big country. How do you think we became a big country? We don't give up any land. <laughs> so, but it was very, very, um, again, uh, it was entertaining. And although we uh, spoke of, of yeah, co matters of, of great importance, it was done in such an atmosphere that you didn't feel uh, on a cliff. But Iran, um, aren't we um, overstating the case uh, going back to uh, Donald Trump and Kim? Um, the the uh, simplistic belief that if you hit it off with a leader, everything will be fine. No, uh, it's not about hitting off uh, and, and, and Trump's uh, pathetic attempt to treat uh, Kim Jong-un as a son or something. Uh, this was destined to... First be. rocket man and then... Well, I don't think you, you actually... You, you can hardly uh, draw any general conclusions from Trump's conduct. This is what uh, they call in, uh, uh, in good Latin, sui generis, uh, unique. But... Uh, I think there's a difference between the situations that arise and in normal, placid times when personalities do not matter that much. You go by procedure, your organizational background matters. And the moments of crisis, and it is in moments of crisis, in, in, in very dramatic circumstances, that you have leaders rising uh, to, the, to center stage. I, none, I think nobody in this room will remember who was the uh, chancellor of Germany in 1914. Von Bettmann? Uh, Bettmann von Holweg, I think, okay. but, but, but who, who cares? Or, or, exactly. <laughs> who cares? Or, 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 um, ask, or what was the role of Asquith in the coming of the Great War? They were something in, that had to do with, with his wife, some scandal. They thought they were living in normal times. They didn't realize that they were all bringing their nations over the cliff. In, 30, in, in World War II, was a war of leaders. Where they, or know, the Hitler, lack thereof. Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, and Churchill. Some of the leaders brought about the war. It was not only the war right. which brought the best in Churchill and, or Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And then, um, quite... We, if you're familiar with uh, the book that Lucas wrote about uh, Five Days in May, it, uh, had it been Halifax, and it was that close, the king actually had to choose between Halifax, whom he liked, and Winston Churchill, whom he heartily disliked. And he made a choice that we know now for certain meant that we can sit here in Jerusalem as living Jews because otherwise... But Halifax uh, went to Washington the way Danny was he sent. Was, yes. <laughs> he was sent to Washington. Uh, Churchill got rid of him as foreign that minister was an after, for, after May. 
But in that sense, are you talking about the king? There would have been surrender. Or? Yeah, well, here the, the, the decision was the king's. The personality was churches. And then how it works, uh, you know that Roosevelt didn't quite trust this old colonial character. He sent his closest friend, Hopkins, Hopkins to measure him out. And, and uh, this gives us one of the best stories I've, I've ever read. Towards the end, uh, Churchill couldn't resist it. They asked uh, Harry Hopkins, what are you going to tell the president? And Harry Hopkins starts quoting from the Book of Ruth. Now, I shall go where you shall go, I shall go. And that was the, uh, the building of the alliance that won the war. Without it. Now, Reuven, many of uh, Israel's letter leaders came from the military. And you've known uh, some of them, and you've seen them in uniform and later out of uniform. Is there a difference between military leadership and national leadership? And um, does the fact that you have such a background give you an advantage or disadvantage? Mostly disadvantage, I think. Well, of course, a big advantage because you're aware of the, your surroundings. You have a strategic understanding of our threats and our military capabilities that we perceive as vital for our existence. But we are also fixed in this uh, strange paradigm as if those that sprang out of our, we call it Sayeret Matkal, our elite commando unit, they will naturally be the best prime ministers. Now, even if some of them are good and talented and they, can, they could theoretically do a good job, Certainly, this isn't one pattern that if we follow that pattern, we have excellent leaders because we lose the whole dimension of diplomacy and sensitivity. And by the way, no women, because currently we don't have women that serve in those specific combat roles. So we have this, this forged, right? We have this complex thing where only men go in, only officers from a certain unit, and most of them become our senior leaders. So again, with all due respect to their great capabilities, many, many disadvantages, which means we're also fixated in the this macho, middle-aged man, right, that came out of an organization where he gave an order and it happened. After decades of giving orders and everything happened, suddenly you're a leader, you're a politician, you're a diplomat, <coughs> so you're not even used to that. What do you mean? I, I said that should happen. Why didn't it happen? No sensitivities, no, compl no complexities. Mm -hmm. So again, I gave all the, all the negative side, which means I think we should, as a country, mature. Maybe if Iran doesn't get nuclear weapons and we are able to mature without always having this existential threat and believing that we're living on our sword minute to minute, maybe we'll be able to mature and have a 40-year-old woman as our prime minister. Not just that, but we'll add in that India is a nuclear country. Pakistan, <clears throat> excuse me, is a nuclear company, country. And both of them have had women leaders. The fact that there's nuclear challenges doesn't mean that women shouldn't or can't be leaders. Britain and Thatcher. Also, a nuclear Again, country. But in this case, I'm talking about nuclear <laughs> threshold and the possibility of right. war. And this isn't this isn't a theory. Currently, we have a prime minister that sprang out of these units, right? It's this basic mindset. Any I'm Naftali Bennett. <laughs> I'm like Ehud Barak. I'm like a BB, right? I'm, I'm, I'm made of the same the stuff. Of the of the special forces. So I have what it takes. In the last 25 years, we had <clears throat> one prime minister for two years, more or less, who actually, or three years, who did not spring. <laughs> from the uh, special forces. Now, uh, let's talk a moment about collective leadership, because we do have one in Israel right now. We have a prime minister who is, uh, at most, first among equals. Politically, he is perhaps the weaker of all the partners in, in this um, coalition. And we know of uh, cases uh, in relatively his recent history um, the Soviet Union after Stalin, when you had Khrushchev and Malenkov and Bulganin until Khrushchev emerged. And then after Khrushchev was toppled, Brezhnev, Podgorny and Kosygin until Brezhnev emerged. Can you, looking at the, the collective leadership, know in advance who among them will years from now emerge, or if you look back at it, will be the leader? I don't think so. I think it very much depends on the different countries and types of governments that they're coming from. You gave different examples. Again, in non-democracies, perhaps it can be more clear. 
you're going to know who has the power. You mentioned before, <clears throat> sorry, Putin, KGB, and you say, okay, in the countries around us. Unless it's Beria and you kill him. But I'll give that example here right now where we're looking at who's going to be the leader in the Palestinian world, the Palestinian Authority, after Mahmoud Abbas. Okay, it's like mm -hmm. that's our case study for right mm -hmm. now to try and pinpoint who's going to be the next leader. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at the ones who have power. Do I know between those different ones who hold different types of power? Who will be the one that will be able to step into the shoes because that's easier, to take it over physically because it's brutal? I can't tell that right now. So what I'm going to be able to do is give the list of names of who I see. But at the end, it's not that simple, as we've said about other things. Iran, Miri um, has been speaking as if we are all detached observers. But sometimes, <laughs> as is the case of the Palestinian Authority, we, we um, may feel the urge to dabble in it. Uh, well, I've spent a good part of my academic career looking at it in interventions, you know, uh, going back to what happened uh, last week, 80 years ago, when the British ambassador in Cairo told King Farouk who should be the prime minister of Egypt, uh, tanks around the uh, Abdin Palace, and that enabled Britain to uh, fight and win in El Alamein. So it was indirectly well, uh, an enabler event, enabling event of the most, one of the most turn, important turning points in the war. So intervention is, of course, against the basic principles of both the UN and going back to the uh, peace of Westphalia. And it is as common as the grass. We even had a situation where in Israel, uh, an American president intervened in our politics with a saxophone. He came to play music in the in school in order to support the candidacy of Shimon Peres in 96. And succeeded. And failed. And failed. <laughs> so, it, so it is counterproductive. <laughs> <at times. laughs> Thanks would have been that more... That has to do also with leadership, leadership and what people well, are saying. His tune was not on key. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, Putin's uh, purpose may be to have someone else as president of Ukraine, uh, which is what happened after the five-day war in 2008 in, in Georgia. And in fact, the 2014 crisis uh, with the Crimea started after Yanukovych, who was pro-Russian, uh, was no longer in office. So um, the question is, should um, a country such as Israel intervene in the Palestinian Authority. The Americans tried and failed uh, several times, uh, South Vietnam, uh, of course, with the uh, DM assassination um, in late 1963 yeah. is an example. But Mossadegh in, in Iran uh, was, uh, quote unquote, a successful uh, example. Our bands in Guatemala, yes. These were the heyday, this was the heyday of CIA uh, Special operations. Pinochet, Chile. Um, Keep going, Central yeah. America. <laughs> and Batista. <laughs> so, interestingly, Pinochet was not uh, an American job. So, looking looking at the uh, world scene right now, uh, we have uh, less than um, a quarter of an hour. Who will emerge as the leader of the second quarter of the 21st century? We are three years ahead of that. Well, he certainly has positioned himself to break the 10-year system and become a leader for life. First since Mao, really. Deng was always in the shadows. He was Vice immensely Premier. powerful, but he was not, he did not hold the formal positions that she holds. And his choices and his decisions will determine uh, the course of the of world affairs in the second quarter, for sure. Ruben, um, does a Macron, a one of a succession of uh, British prime ministers who seem to come and go without leaving uh, quite a mark, except for Brexit, uh, which is- Pretty big mark. Which is, yes, has yeah. been quite a change. Um, <laughs> well, do you it's see- It's a story of leadership failure because Cameron initiated it in order for it to be rejected and he lost his, political life. Okay. So do you see anyone emerge uh, in the Western democracies? Well, unfortunately, no. And I think also the, the way, you know, things are, history is unfolding, it less necessitates that. So when you have Second World War and someone like Churchill comes along, so he assumes the responsibility, 
does a brilliant job, or probably if he wouldn't have done what he'd done, the history would have taken a different course. Right now, as we see it, especially you know, with Brexit in the UK, uh, the, the influence of Europe is declining. Russia is now very dominant. But remember that if we are faced with challenges like the Second World War, and who knows? Who knows what's going to unfold in Europe? People will rise to the occasion. Maybe someone will rise to the occasion. Maybe new alliances will be forged. Maybe NATO will shape, uh, change its, its form. Re remember, in recent years, NATO uh, sort of felt like they don't have the rivalry of the past and sort of looking for new missions around the world. And, and now these... These tasks are really reemerging. No, that's that's uh, a point which I uh, would like to deflect to to Danny. Um, uh, early in your career, you were posted to the Israeli UN mission, and the United Nations organization used to be uh, important, and the secretaries general had stature. Hammerschild, of course, and for a time Uthant until he failed in 1967. Do you see anyone? In such an organization, obviously, a compromise candidate, uh, all the big powers have to agree on. Um, but do you see anyone emerging um, as a world leader? Well, at this point, unfortunately, not. But there is a potential uh, because this organization is supposed to be neutral, because it doesn't have a political power and it doesn't have, you know, a host of armies. Uh, behind it, there is a chance to do it if indeed there is a leader who can, I would say, permeate um, credibility and trust. I don't see the current one uh, doing it, but for instance, you know, there was an idea back in the early 2000s after Clinton left office. For Shibon Paris. Right. To become Secretary General. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who is a real politician, who is a wheeler dealer, in, in a sense, could do the step up to the plate without, without the power of the organization, but because there is no power to the organization, the individual can step up, but this really, a character here and the personality does matter but, here more than anything else. But that, that is for um, a senior politician who retires from politics in their own country. And we see right now uh, Stoltenberg in NATO having been prime minister, is now going to be the governor of his central bank when he goes back to right. Norway. Miri, let me ask you about monarchies and dynasties, political dynasties. We have the Hashemites. We have the, the Clintons. We have well, it, it it didn't turn out uh, the Bushes the way it expected. <laughs> yes, uh, no, but we have monarchies in the Middle East, Absolutely. in Morocco, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, Jordan. in in many of the uh, Gulf. Uh, uh, chic domes or oil domes, and we have political dynasties such as Assad in uh, Syria in power for uh, more than 50 years now. Uh, Hafez Assad for 30 and now Bashar Assad. So um, is this a good model for stability, um, especially in countries um, uh, which have known coups and, and uh, insurrections and re rebellions. Um, I want to make a statement here because I feel that we've kind of gone off topic. Yay, stability. People have no rights. We're talking about um, non-democracies where the people themselves, us, okay, um, cannot think, say, or do. We're talking about basic freedoms that I want to hope that most of our viewers take for granted. I want to hope so. So, no, I am not a person who supports not dynasties and not monarchies. And I don't think it makes a big difference, and I'm different than a lot of people in that sense, when it's one that we like, like King Hussein or King Abdullah II of Jordan, because that's a good one, because they're more open. They may be slightly more open in what they do with their people, but that has to do with their own stability, so they let out a little more leash. Or if you have the type of monarchy in Saudi Arabia, where, again, as a woman, zilch status and or Assad who everybody knows is a butcher but he's not that different nowadays everybody's going to hate me for this one not on dynasties but for um, what happens in Egypt I'm saying about these non-elected different type of leaders they can be monarchies they can be dynasties and they can just be people who took over in a coup um, I'm not surprised that the dynasties do that 
That is actually part of how they keep their own stability and power. You keep it within the family. You keep it within, I'm looking at Amir in the eye, at Reuven in the eye, at Iran in the eye. I believe you, and you're the ones who are close to me. That's how Assad based that power on a very close-knit family and outer circle, which is um, based within the 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 religious background, the ethnic background. But just in case, with a gun in his pocket. Just in case, but it's very family-oriented. And the same in that sense, I think that Jordan was overwhelmed by the fact that there was uh, almost perhaps coup attempt from a, bother, a brother. Saudi Arabia, um, you know, Muhammad, I mean, he put them in jail. Mohammed bin Salman put cousins in jail, meaning you look at it. So that stability is not something that I aspire to. Ruben. Well, first, I have to agree. You know, we, we cannot, as people that believe in democracy and freedom, say anything positive about this wave, this kind of regime. But if we try to analyze the topic that we're discussing here, how much does personality matter? We can't make the mistake of thinking that these, uh, these uh, rulers and, and kings for them, it's easy. It's all them. It's their best personality. Whatever they say happens, period. And we that live in democracies here, it's co it's complex. The people have their say. So the, our prime minister really isn't that powerful. I, I think that's not the case. First, in this day and age, kings and monarchs and all that, they do have the world stage and pressures and interests. Second, they have internal conflict. And when they have an uprising on their hands, they have it very difficult, so they have to always take into consideration what the people will say, even if they're a minority, especially if they're a minority. And the flip side of that, and the fascinating thing for me, is in our democracies, our prime ministers sometimes act like kings. Hmm. When President Trump comes along, he leaves this treaty, that treaty, whatever he's, right? He does things right and left, does it make sense? Who knows, but it, he's the king. Also in Israel, our prime minister wants to do something. It's almost as if the Israeli people say, Will he give the Palestinians a uh, territory? Will he give them a state? What do you mean, will he give? He, but when he wants something and he's powerful, then he can he can uh, promote his agenda. Yeah. I, I want to come in in defense of the idea of monarchy as a in the case of constitutional monarchies. Actually, the most democratic nations on earth happen to be constitutional monarchies. Um, I don't know about Britain, but certainly Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Um, dominions. The Dominions. Um, yeah. I'm going to push back on that one. The three okay. Scandinavians. Uh, but you say not that. Not Finland, but you, the three others. But going back to Australia. The Netherlands. But uh, uh, very, Iran. very democratic country. Lived without a government now for more than a year. Uh, but uh, but okay. uh, definitely the, the, the presence of a non-interventionist monarchy as a symbol of the state so that uh, politics can be played at the, at, the le at the appropriate level and not aspire to, uh, uh, to kingship, uh, prime ministerial kingship. I think that's not necessarily that's, that's a bad idea. That I'm that's French. fine as, as a <laughs> constitutional monarchy 101, but uh, you know better than most that Spain and Belgium have undergone corruption scandals, which had mm -hmm. to do with either the monarchs or the crown princes True enough, but Spain actually democratized when the monarchy was restored. But again, for a, wh for a while. I'm going to be with the uh, Revolution in France. And, uh, um, uh, isn't one of the problems that um, we, Israelis, but others too, want a leader um, for our neighbors who will be strong enough to uh, put um, his uh, imprimatur and discipline his um, um, population. And hopefully be pro-Israel. But, pro but weak, enough, weak enough so that we can control him. Arafat, of course, uh, is a case in point. And um, if you take a Saddam Hussein or a Gaddafi, uh, they were dictators who held their countries together. Uh, the world is better off without them, but their countries uh, have uh, not, not uh, have barely survived. Um, what's your idea? Who says life is simple? I don't think that because of that we get to support dictators in the way that they are. And I give the example of North Korea, and yes, I go to that extremity, but I can go to every single country in the Middle East. Having said that, stability and understanding in today's day and age what people want, I think that we are in a new time, certainly looking forward. Once upon a time, that stability came out of a lot of ignorance of not knowing stuff. 
Nowadays, every single one of us holds that cute little um, machine that's called a smartphone everywhere throughout all of these countries. People know other ideas. They want more. Does that mean that that immediately means a revolution and, and you have to throw over the monarchy? No, but perhaps that they will have to have some kind of interaction and response to their people together with that stability. There is a cultural aspect, but that would be for a but, different one. But what you are also referring to obliquely is that there are technological or corporate leaders, the Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, Steve Jobs. Um, Monarchs. Who, yes, um, multi, multinational uh, uh, leaders. Um, final words, Iran. Well, I, I believe that personalities do matter. Um, without uh, Deng, I cannot imagine uh, China as it is today. Uh, Trump did uh, huge damage to American uh, standing and credibility uh, through personal acts, not, not policy decisions, but personal traits and, and in the sense that you, the, United, the, great, the, the leader of the world cannot be relied on, the free world cannot be relied upon. Uh, Churchill, of course, is another example. In normal times, it's less necessary, but we are not in normal times. Ruben? Well, it's clear that we only scratched the surface here, and I think our, our final conclusion is that it's very hard to predict, impossible to shape, and there's a lot more to learn about this. Really? I'm looking at culture, and I'm wondering what our culture of human beings is going to bring as our next leaders. Five Olaf, seconds. Olaf Schulz, the newly inaugurated Chancellor of Germany has the chance to be the leader, the Western leader, for the next 25 years. Why? Because of structure. The question is his personality. Daniel Yalon, Miri Eisen, Ruben Ben Shalom, Iran Lerman, thank you all, and we will be back for another edition of Powers in Play. Welcome uh, back um, next month.